Hey guys, today I'm going to go through some of the ways that your car might not want to start for you. So there's going to be some more simple stuff here and some more complicated stuff and I'll try to work through it in some sort of order that you might want to check, you know, the cheap simple stuff first or the most common stuff first and move on from there. Your car needs a handful of things though to start. It's going to need, obviously going to need to crank, turn that motor. It's going to need a proper air fuel ratio. It's going to need spark and it's going to need compression. So the, one of the more common things is going to be your battery. A battery really lasts on average maybe five years. So it's pretty common in the life of your car, you're going to have to change the battery at least once. And a symptom of a bad battery is usually a slow crank. So you go to turn the ignition and it's just kind of cranks kind of slow and stumbles to a start or maybe doesn't even start at all. That's going to be your battery. Now, if your car is really cranking really slow or doesn't want to crank and you jump start it and um, and it starts fine, but then you, you take the jumper cables off and you try to drive and it stalls and the battery's dead once again, that's going to actually lead towards your alternator. So it's your battery might be fine. The alternator just doesn't want to keep recharging it because it's kind of like your battery's recharging system. Um, onto the starter. So if you turn the key and it just kind of clicks, you get a click. Maybe it clicks a bunch of times and every once in a while it starts. Um, that's going to point to your starter or your starter solenoid. Um, next kind of things you're going to want to look for. So let's say it, it is cranking good, but it just doesn't want to start pretty common that's going to lead towards either an air fuel issue or a spark issue. So we'll start with fuel. If it cranks and cranks and cranks forever and it doesn't even want to remotely sputter, that's usually going to be a fuel pump. So it's just not delivering any fuel. If it, sometimes a fuel pump can fail in such a way that nine out of 10 times it starts when you turn the key. And then one out of 10 times it cranks forever and forever and forever and you just can't get that thing to start. So I've actually had an old truck that um, the, well, so the fuel pump's actually located in the gas tank on most modern cars. So this old truck, it, in order to get it to start, I would have to kick the gas tank and it would jar the fuel pump just enough to get it to get into a position where it could click and it could fire, push that fuel and start. I wouldn't say that's going to work on every vehicle, but I've seen it on one old truck I had and another truck of my buddies that actually did that. Um, additionally, in the fuel system, there's usually a fuel filter, but a lot of times on these new cars, the fuel filter is integrated into the tank as well or as part of the fuel pump, so it's really just not very serviceable. If you have an older car, though, check the fuel filter. They're usually really easy to change on an older car. Um, from there, you've got fuel injectors. And for a fuel injector to randomly fail, I guess that could happen, but um, hopefully you'll get an engine code for that, like a misfire code or like a, um, uh, I don't know, hopefully you'll get some sort of code for that because it's really going to be hard for you to for sure know other than the fact that the engine might, when it does run, kind of sound like it's not really running on all cylinders, literally. Um, that goes on to my next point. This is an OBD2 code reader, and these things are really cheap. You can get them for under $20 nowadays. They used to be pretty expensive, but um, this one I think is like 15 bucks. I'll put a link to it. And what you can do with these is you can plug them in right near your brake pedal. There's a little port for it. And if your car is giving you an error code, saying like a sensor or something is bad, you'll be able to know it on this, and it saves all that hassle of you trying to guess of which particular thing's wrong with your car. So maybe a good starting point before you get super, super deep into it. And if it's not one of those really, really obvious problems. The, the next thing would be your air delivery system. So the second half of the fuel air ratio. And some of the things you wanna just kinda look for would be um, a vacuum leak, that'd be pretty common. So your intake manifold pulls a vacuum when the when the engine cranks which sucks the air in sucks the fuel in and um, if you get a vacuum leak it's going to cause a really lean air fuel ratio and it's just not going to want to start good so some places you might want to check are like any of these rubber hoses they could get all dry and cracked 
This is a plastic intake manifold, so you could see a situation where it could crack. Um, any gaskets. So look hard at those. You can take a bottle of soapy water and spray it around and listen while your engine's running because it might, like if, if the soapy water covers a little spot where it's leaking, it could dip the RPM. So that could be an indication of that's where your leak is. But check all that stuff. Some things that can make sneaky leaks would be like a PCV valve, positive crankcase ventilation valve. If it's not functioning properly, um, the one way it can fail is that it can fail so it's not actually closing. So it's supposed to close when this draws a high vacuum. Um, it's supposed to suck this little, little spring-loaded valve up and close it off so that it, this can pull a good vacuum, pull all that air and fuel. So if it's not doing that, um, it can cause your car to act like it has a vacuum leak. And these are really cheap. This is another like a $15 part. So it's something that you want to check, maybe say it's not unusual at like 75,000 miles that could fail because it is a mechanical valve. Um, you can unscrew it and stick your finger over it. And if it's drawing a lot of vacuum through this, that would be an indication that it's bad. Or like I said, if you shake it and it's not shaking, that's an indication that's bad. And worst case, if it fails in the opposite direction where it's not venting the crank, you could have a lot of oil seal failures, which would be a really big problem. So it's something you just want to keep your eye on. The, um, the exhaust gas regeneration, the EGR valve, could also fail in a way that it acts like a vacuum leak. Um, again, it's probably not one of the more obvious reasons, but it's one more thing to look at. Another area for leaks to check would be the area between, like, so this tube that goes, leads to your, um, to your throttle body. So any leaks here could actually cause issues because they're past the mass airflow sensor. So if it thinks this X amount of air is going through here, but there's a leak that's causing a different amount of air, it could cause some starting issues. And it's probably gonna cause it to run a little bit lean, which is gonna be, make it hard to start. The mass airflow sensor um, is usually located right here on the intake tube somewhere. It's you know between the air filter and the throttle body, and it's probably the only thing that has wires connected into it there. It can get dirty or it can fail. So it's really easy to clean it. If you take it out, it's very delicate, so be gentle with it, but they make a cleaner that you just spray on it and spray it off, let it dry, stick it back in. It can get dirty. It can especially get dirty if you run something like a, an air filter that requires oil, like a K&N filter. It could just get a little bit of oil residue on it and, and read inaccurately. Um, if you're going through all these hassles, you should probably consider changing your air, air filter, checking your air filter. If it gets super dirty, it could cause issues. Um, there's a map sensor here. So this reads the, the negative pressure in your manifold. So that's something that could cause issues, but now we're getting like deeper down the line of things that could go wrong, but if they go wrong, hopefully they'll give you a, co a code on the OBD2. And you don't wanna just like change all your sensors and hope for the best, because it could get really expensive. Um, spark, so spark on like some engines, it's really easy to change the spark plugs on some engines. This is a Subaru, so it's not super easy. But if you got over 100,000 miles, you might want to think about changing your spark plugs. It's, whether it's the cause, I, mean, I rarely see that to be the cause of a starting issue anymore. On old cars, that was like the go-to thing. Um, to create the spark though, you've got your spark plugs, your caps, your wires, coils, and then you've also got sensors to trigger that spark. So on new cars, the sensors that you have are usually a crank case or a crankshaft position sensor and sometimes a um, camshaft position sensor. So those are two more sensors. And like I said, it's gonna be hard to know exactly which one of these things is causing your trouble, but check the forums online because for a lot of cars, there's like the one common failure. Um, I know Subaru 2.5 engines have certain failures that are just common for those engines. So check out the forums. 
Um, I think that for the most part covers all the, you know, ignition and air fuel issues. The third, the I guess it's the fourth and probably worst thing that could happen would be a compression issue. So um, if you have access to a compression gauge and if you can get to your spark plugs, you can check the compression on your engine. And if one cylinder is reading low, that's gonna be an indication that you do have a pretty serious problem on your hand. So a reason that a cylinder could read low could be a lot of things, but one could be a valve that's stuck sticking open slightly or not closing off all the way. It could be a valve that's really so dirty that it's not closing. It could be um, piston rings. It could be a scuffed cylinder wall or a scuffed piston. So all those things are bad. You don't really want to deal with any of those things. But that could be an issue on a really, really old car that could um, cause starting issues. And at that point, you're starting to wonder, is it worth fixing or not? It's going to depend on your situation, but that's one more bad way that your engine could have trouble starting. I would say that covers most of the obvious things. The only other thing I didn't say is check for, like if you're not getting anything or it's cranking and it could be a spark issue, check your fuse box because you usually have a fuse box under your hood and one um, up by your brake pedal. If you have a blown fuse, that's an, that's an issue that could cause um, either no spark or no crank. So check that. And I think that pretty much covers, you know, all the heavy hitters on why your car might not start. If you like this video, make sure to click the little subscribe button below. And if you've had any other tricks or ways to identify ways that your car's not starting, um, make sure to post them in the comments. And because I like to always hear new ideas there so I can learn for my own self. Um, Actually, you know what? There's one more thing. There's on a lot of these cars. There's a um, coolant temperature sensor. So if the engine doesn't know what temperature is when it's trying to start, it could deliver the wrong amount of fuel. But I think that's the last one I'm going to say today. So thanks for watching, and make sure you check out my other videos.